President Bola Tinubu has directed the National Economic Council, NEC, led by the Vice President Kashim Shatima, to kickstart the process of working on interventions to cushion the impact of subsidy removal on the people. The President also swore in the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Senator George Akume, making him the first appointee of the Tinubu administration to take the oath of office. State House correspondent Adesua Morwa reports. Dear true Malaysians, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and let us preserve, protect, and defend those of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. With the administration of the Oath of Allegiance and the Oath of Office, uh, Senator George Akume, former Governor Benue State, and immediate past Minister of Special Duties and Intergovernmental Affairs, officially assumes the role of Secretary to the Government of the Federation. The ceremony, which was held at the Council Chambers of the State House, brought together several guests, including seven and former Governors. Among those present were Vice President Kashim Shatima, President of the Senate Hamid Lawan, well wishes, and family members. In his first media interaction, George Akume expresses his unwavering dedication to ensuring that Nigerians enjoy the full benefits of democracy under the leadership of President Bola Tinubu. I assure Nigerians I will do my best. I will not disappoint the President. I will not disappoint this country. I will not disappoint my party. I believe. Nigerians will find fulfillment in my responsibilities as I discharge them. Top officials say Senator Akume's wealth of experience in comparison executive and legislative roles as a former governor, senator and minister instills confidence in his ability to carry out his duties effectively. We know what he has offered in the past many, many, many decades uh, for the state and for the nation, we are very confident, too confident, that he's also going to deliver and the nation is going to be proud that uh, our choicest man from the state is selected uh, and sworn in for this great job. My husband is a very hard working man, very humble, kind, compassionate. He relates with people very well. And I know this time, too, he will do the best. Shortly thereafter, President Tinubu received the Governor's Forum, comprising governors from all 36 states in the country. This marks his initial interaction with the sub-national leaders following a separate meeting he had with governors from his political party, the APC. Furthermore, in light of the removal of petrol subsidy and subsequent increase in fuel prices, President Tinubu met with major oil marketers led by the Governor of Ogun State. It came to light that the president, during his meeting with the governors, issued directives for the National Economic Council to get to work. He also emphasized the need for collaboration among political leaders to alleviate poverty. The marketers commended his bold actions in ending the subsidy regime and pledged their cooperation with government interventions aimed at mitigating the effects of subsidy removal. Some of us are looking at um, um, enhancement of minimum wage, Mr. President has announced today that, you know, NEC should immediately begin uh, to sit, uh, led by His Excellency, the Vice President, um, uh, Senator uh, Akashim Shatima, and the committee of NEC alongside, you know, with the economic team and marketers should sit down and come up with a wholesome uh, um, approach that would be beneficial uh, to the common man uh, and generality of, of Nigerians. He asked and he interjected with very, very intelligent questions. And he understood what we meant by saying we want a complete free market. Free market, we want to have one exchange rate so people can stop trading in dollars. If we have free exchange rates, then we can compete in importation, compete in licensing and uh, having refineries running. We're going to work at providing real mass transit buses that work, the ones that will run on CNG, which is the compressed natural gas and diesel interchangeably. And hopefully we're going to start with about 50 to 100. And that is in the very, very short term. And then, and these are locally produced. So you see that we're also providing jobs, a lot more jobs, because we're using local assembly plants. We're not importing this. Adesua, Omoruan, Arise News.
All right, let's talk about. Good to see you guys again. Ayo, how are you? Bonjour, welcome back. Somehow, somehow, <laughs> good somehow. to see you. <laughs> okay, so um, a lot obviously has happened in the yeah. past few days, but still top of um, in terms of the headlines and stories is the fuel subsidy removal, mm. how Nigerians are responding to it, and very importantly, how the government mm. is responding to it. And we saw the first, well, shall we call it the official um, National Executive Council meeting mm. there with the state governors, because mm. as we know, the president hasn't quite yet um, completed the appointments in terms of ministers. Uh, he has had two appointments. One has taken the oath of office, as mm. we saw there, great report by Adesua, uh, the former governor of uh, Benway State, Senator George Akume, yeah. now the Secretary General to the Federation. And um, so there, there had been some conversations around the fact that he's also appointed Honorable Femi Bajabi Amila yeah. as, the, um, as the Chief of Staff. Uh, who would also take an oath of office? But it's important to know that in his appointment letter, his start date is the day after he finishes his tenure um, as the Speaker of the House of the Ninth Assembly. So he hasn't yet taken office fully, you know, got, um, taken his office fully. So he is the first Senator George Akume in terms of political appointees, and he's gone straight to work. You know, he was um, present at that Executive Council meeting. The uh, meat of this is the outcome of what's happened. I must state that it is important to note that out of 36 governors of the um, Federation, 22 were in attendance, whilst two of uh, two others uh, represented their principals, so deputy governors, I believe, of um, Edo State and um, one other state in the north. Then we also had that the other governors who couldn't make it were, you know, un unfortunately you know, absent. But what is important to note in the 22 governors, amongst the 22 governors who were present, was that they were across different party um, backgrounds. So we had not uh, party members not just from APC. We also had from Alex Oti from um, the Labour Party. We had uh, governors who were from the PDP um, party. And the president spoke to that. I must admit that we must give credit to where it is due. Since his inauguration, the president has made very presidential statements, particularly in the area of bringing people together irrespective of what or how they voted or so, what, who they supported in the last elections and also pushing for um, you know, poverty alleviation and the best for the Nigerian people. He reiterated this yesterday at the meeting and actually tasked the governors in their respective states to ensure that they um, do practical, they, they, they take practical measures to end poverty, which he described as seeing, you can see it on the faces of the people, and you can't deny that profile. Mm. Even if we didn't have the statistics of the 133 um, million Nigerians who have, been, who have come into multidimensional mm. poverty, you can see that the people are poor, and mm -hmm. some people might be made poorer by this fuel subsidy removal and and its um, consequences. Also important, as we heard from Mrs. Akpani, who is the chairman as well, who also see, um, doubles as chairman of um, DAPMAN, Depot and Petroleum Products um, Marketers of Association of Nigeria, where she talked about what they themselves are doing mm -hmm. to support the government in its efforts to end subsidy. I thought it was instructive to mention that they were donating 100 buses, but she said 50 to 100 buses, and that they were going to be powered by CNG. We talked about this on Monday, mm -hmm. um, compressed natural gas and um, diesel interchangeably. Also, that it will be locally manufactured, thereby providing jobs for Nigerians. Yeah. Excellent point. Yeah. I think that other stakeholders have talked about this, that beyond the government's palliatives or um, you know, efforts to cushion the effects of the fuel subsidy removal, private sector initiatives, particularly people who are players in this sector, mm. should also do their own part in terms of bringing, you know, in terms of helping the Nigerian people uh, cope better, perhaps, with this fuel subsidy removal. Okay. Look forward to more interventions in the coming days. Dr. Bati. Congratulations to uh, George Akume. He's been governor of Benue State. He's been, uh, um, you know, special um, minister in charge of uh, uh, special, special duties, duties to President Buhari. And now he has managed to survive and show up as secretary to the government of the Federation. The Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation oversees about 33 parastatas of government. So it's a very huge uh, responsibility. And it usually helps when the Secretary to the Government of the Federation of Nigeria has governance experience. So he has had very significant governance experience that will help him uh, in that position uh, to be able to deliver and to be able to work closely with the president. It's also the office of the secretary to the government of the federation. That is the secretary to the federal executive council. In other words, the executive council 
of the Federation. His office prepares all the relevant memos and makes sure that that Wednesday meeting that some people say is constitutional even if it is not, you know, happens on a regular basis. So he has a lot of work ahead of him. What he, he must watch out for, because he may not have had the experience in that regard, this may be new experience for him, is to make sure that he avoids clashes with the office of the chief of staff. The office of the chief of staff to the president of Nigeria prepares the memos, summarizes the memos. Oftentimes, what happens is that you have that conflict between you know, the office of the SGF organizing the meetings on Wednesdays and also the office of the chief of staff that runs the villa. So George Akume will need to go into this assignment with a lot of maturity. The other thing to add is that the appointment of George Akume will be like a way of reaching out to the North Central. I have been pushing for, oh, the Senate presidency should come to the North Central. So something has been given to the North uh, Central uh, through George Akume. So in other words, he's also representing his own people in that position. But the bigger interest is to represent the people of Nigeria. All those 33 parastators that are under that office are there not for the people of the North Central, but the people of Nigeria. Yes, uh, Bajabi Amila yesterday gave his uh, farewell speech as uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, by next week, he will functionally assume office as says, uh, you know, Chief of Staff to the President. The Chief of Staff to the President is also a very important uh, position. And it requires a lot of attentiveness, a lot of energy. I hope he will not spend that, uh, his time in that office trying to hang around the president as a bag carrier. Because there are many people who are already showing up. They just want to carry bag. No. The chief of staff sits down to do the work and assist the president. In fact, in our time, the chief of staff never traveled with the president. Because he has to be on the ground to coordinate all the things that come to the desk of the uh, president. I hope Bajabi Amela will not make the mistake of thinking that this is a ceremony and he wants to be traveling all over the place. No, the job of the chief of staff is to sit down and do the job. The presidency will provide him, uh, as has been the case over the years, with necessary support. And we have seen how Professor Gambari, uh, Ibrahim Gambari, you know, being the seasoned te technocrat, helped uh, President Buhari to anchor that office. And when he got there, of course, there was improvement on all fronts in terms of speech writing, in terms of coordination. So it's not the place to go and uh, be doing a uh, emilocon. Uh, now we did there. Uh, no, it's very serious work that requires a lot of intellectual input. Okay, now we move to the fact that the president met with uh, uh, 22 governors, two deputy uh, governors. Well, the president stated the obvious, saying that, look, we have to work together. We have to go beyond partisanship. That's what you should say. Because what Nigeria needs now is that synergy that he talked about, that coordination that he talked about, and the issues that he identified, multidimensional poverty, corruption, smuggling, education challenges, insecurity challenges. These are not issues that can be handled alone by the federal government. The state governors also have a role to play. And that synergy is very important because oftentimes in analyzing Nigeria, we focus only on the federal government. We overlook the state governors. The state governments, they misbehave are plenty, but not enough attention is paid to them. And those governors who were there should see it as a wake up call. The president reminding them that the elections have ended. Now it's time for everybody to work together. And it's in that context that he directed the National Economic Council. Uh, led by uh, Kashim Shetima, his vice president, to look into what palliatives uh, that we can uh, come up with. Those palliatives will also be agreed upon by the state uh, governments. But the uh, conversation in that regard, it will be interesting uh, to monitor uh, that conversation. Finally, Governor Dakwabi Odun of Ogun State, uh, who had been, you know, previously chairman, national chairman of DAPMAN, he himself uh, is a major player in that uh, sector, 
uh, which is a petroleum company, Hayden, I think, Hayden Oil, yeah, Hayden Petroleum. it is called, you know, uh, led the group there. And, you know, the uh, president also of that association uh, spoke with the president. And what that association, that man and woman said is that they are going to support uh, the president uh, in this subsidy removal agenda. And that on their own, they are promising 100 CMG, compressed natural gas CNG uh, uh, vehicles, uh, buses, you know, to support this. Okay, the devil in this regard is in the details. Because we had the same kind of situation in 2012. At the Eagle Square, buses were provided to uh, NURTW, National Union of uh, Road Transport Workers, and also Road Transport uh, Employers Association of Nigeria, RTAN. What happened to those buses? That man and woman are saying other uh, stakeholders in the private sector should help provide buses to uh, alleviate transportation problems. Look, as many buses as you put on the road, we just complicate the problem. Do we have institutional memory in this country? Has anybody made any attempt to study what happened in 2012 with all those buses that were launched with uh, NURTW and RTEA at Igu Square. So look, we shouldn't just uh, be doing symbolism. People should think. There must be people in the system who have institutional memory and who can make the details available. So I'm not excited about, oh, we are going to provide the 100 uh, uh, CMG buses. Some of those buses may not make any difference. In a country that needs, really, mass transportation schemes, to help the people, not putting more buses uh, on the road. But that's what they think. And NLC has said there's nothing on the table yet, that the next meeting is on June 19. And when that meeting takes place, the consolidated submission of the NLC and TUC signaling that they cannot be divided on the major issues uh, will be the kernel of the matter. Can the Nigerian government afford, for example, to agree on 200,000 Naira uh, minimum, new national minimum wage. We'll see. We're here. We're watching. One thing has to be said that has dogged this administration. Poor planning. The best way to plan is to set your priorities right. But the effect of not planning is incumbent failure. And I hope they watch it. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu made a big mistake by, as, by saying subsidy is gone during his inaugural speech without planning for it. And now he's trying to plan after making a statement. It is always very hard. And that's what we're seeing play out. Anyway, before I start, I'll say kudos to George Akumet that's been sworn in. Also, kudos to the likes of Bajabia Miller, which I think, with his oversight experience in the National Assembly, he should be able to make a dent in the office of the chief of staff. And according to historical insistence, we've actually had very strong and powerful chief of staff. In fact, they become the de facto president at some points. We all remember the case of the last chief of staff before Mr. Gambari. So they've held sway. We all can also wish him well and say he should serve without partisanship and try as much as possible to aid the president in achieving his goals, ambitions, and aspirations. Coming back to poor planning, it is the poor planning that now makes us scamper around for solutions. I think the palliative should have been taught out in the first place. This medicine after death, mark my words, will not give you veritable palliative for the people. What will just happen is that in the end, Nigerians will just have to move on and get used to it. Why more people get poorer and the economic conditions doing do even further. In fact, it has started. The same filling stations that were excited about subsidy removal, now they're not getting people to buy enough fuel from those filling stations. Yeah, we are seeing the gains. They are protesting Cameroon now because their prices have increased. Yes, that's to show that most of our oil was taken away through the border to go so, uh, to, and they were selling them for cheap in Cameroon. But internally, the economy will shrink a little bit as a, as a result of this. And it's when the numbers come out. KPMG has, has already projected about 31% inflation. That could even be more. So part of the poor planning 
is now what we're seeing, the minimum wage. 200,000, I'm very sure that the government will not accept 200,000 minimum wage. I'm very sure. They will have to meet halfway with labor at some point, but I'm very sure because it's not possible in the first place. The government that doesn't make a lot of revenue, with the Nigerian revenue, government revenue just increased all overnight to be able to pay 200,000 for 720,000 20, members of staff of the federal government on the IPs, minor states. How many states are even paying 18,000 minimum wage in the first place? Or 30,000? Probably in the end, some states will just increase and they will use the method of allowing some of their workers for work, to work three days a week to be able to cushion the effect so that other days they will not have to pay for transportation. And at those states, kudos to them have led the way. They are saying three day working week. I think they've bumped up the money to 40,000 minimum wage. In the end, because we failed to plan, Nigerians will just get used to the suffering. And you know the thing about Nigerians, you push them to the world, they enter the world and keep moving. So they will get used to it. The economy will shrink. Hopefully, I think the real palliative will be economic growth to be able to buffer the effects. But the question the government should ask is where is the growth going to come from? Probably CNG buses. This is my calculation. If we get a lot more buses into the production line produced by Nigerian companies, you can get to increase people that are working in the automotive sector. If we make that the order of the day. Yes, Dr. Bati, you are right. We lack institutional memory. You know, it's never worked in the past and all of that. But if we can get private motor operators to buy CNG, but because the problem, and why it's almost not possible any palliative government puts in transportation, is that government doesn't control the transportation value chain. Except for the Lagos state government that has, you know, BRT buses and the likes. Most other state governments do not. The transport companies don't ever work. Remember the TCTC of, this, of those years of oil state? It never worked. And in the end, those buses are ill-managed. But if we make CNG and diesel an alternative, and a lot of these bus owners, luxurious bus owners and the likes, buy these buses, then we can start to grow an automotive sector in Nigeria. If automotive sector growth comes into the economy, it can have some percentage point of growth. And when that happens, people can produce jobs. And economic growth can start to knock out the effects of this hardship that we're going through. So I think the target the government should target now is the economic growth, because that's the only true palliative I see. Any other thing, even an increase in minimum wage, will not go one step further. Because if you increase minimum wage by, say, 30 40 percent, the over 200 percent in crude oil price, in petrol price increase, will nullify any minimum wage you bring out, owing to the fact that there are other inflationary factors like food inflation and core inflation before now. So it's almost impossible. I think what we should target now will be the long-term economic growth that will be able to placate the economy, cool down the economy, and if as we go on and we grow, we can reduce inflation numbers and ensure that there's more food for people and stop insecurity so that farmers can bring their food out and build infrastructure around food distribution network in the country, then I think that should be the true palliative. Because if that happens, food prices can fall. And when food prices fall, a lot can be better. The Eurobas have a saying, and I'm very targeted about food prices. The Eurobas have a saying, but baby batonu ishe, ishe bushe. What it means is that when you take food out of poverty, poverty starts to reduce. So that's the true palliative. And not all of this we are saying, but all of this is because we have not planned. This is what we ought to have talked about before removing the subsidy in the first place. So hopefully, I pray the economy grows, we stabilize things, and the country becomes better for it. Uh, the Senate has passed a bill for the establishment of a police pension board, uh, a move that will balloon the federal government's pension liabilities. With this, the National Pension Commission, PENCOM, might have lost the battle over the Nigerian police force agitation for exemption from the contribution pension scheme. The bill excludes the Nigerian police force, NPF, from the CPS and returns the force to the old benefit scheme, DBS. The CPS has a special feature uh, of being funded by both employees and the employer, which will make the contribution of 18% of the workers monthly paid to the Retirement Savings Account, RSA. Uh, in order for a minimum of 10% contribution by the employer and 8% contribution by the employee, of which the employer is mandated by the CPS law to remit the same amount every month. This is in contrast to the unfounded DBS, which is totally dependent on government budgetary allocation. The evaluation, according to industry stakeholders, indicates that it will cost the federal government an additional $2 trillion, you know, for 300,000 police personnel. Ayo. Well, uh, the House has passed this bill that had been quite contentious, particularly with industry players. On the show um, earlier this year, we had um, had 
the, um, the MD or the uh, president of the uh, Pension Funds Administration Association of Nigeria, Okucha Aguda, who had spoken about why they were against this scheme, not only them, the um, National Pensions Commission as well. As you've mentioned, Rufai, two trillion naira burden on the government. Whilst on paper, it means that the police would not have to, uh, that's police um, officers would not have to uh, contribute to the pension scheme. It also does mean that the government then inherits or takes on a huge liability of two trillion. The big question, as industry players have responded to this news, is number one, how does the government hope to fund this in an economy where we're talking about trying to show up revenue and cut the cost of governance and, go and, and government costs? We're looking at even more um, additional responsibility in terms of the government paying fully for pensions of police officers. In the area where defined scheme has operated, we also see the disadvantages of um, lack of payment of pensions because the government simply cannot pay it, cannot afford to pay it. Therefore, again, it's around um, the revenue, the funds available to actually meet this obligation. Uh, the idea for the National Pension Commission is to ensure that we avoid the lack of you know, pension payment because of the lack of money. Therefore, this you know, this goes against the spirit of that particular um, scheme. So it will be interesting to find out. It's one thing to pass the bill. It's another to see how this will then um, materialize, how this will then be implemented, how this will work, and the, you know, long-term effect on pensions payment for the police um, of, uh, officers. So in summary, what I'll just say is it's too early to celebrate for police officers. It's one thing, as we often hear in government, you can approve a sum of money. It is the actual disbursement of that money that actually matters. Uh, under uh, President Tolusha Gombasanjo, we had pensions reform. And the eventual outcome was determined by the um, body led by uh, Mr. Foladiola, the National Pension Commission at the time. And what the uh, government decided at that time was the introduction of this contributory pension scheme which will make the private sector the center of the management of pensions. And the uh, argument at the time was that this will ensure efficiency. By 2014, some other agencies of government wanted to you know, pull out of the contributory pension scheme. First, the National Assembly Pension uh, you know, Lobby, uh, they wanted to be part of, out of it. The Police Pension Board, also wanted to be out of uh, the contributory uh, pension scheme. Before President Muhammadu Buhari left, he signed and endorsed the uh, National Assembly Pension you know, uh, Board Bill, which means that the National Assembly had been taken out of the contributory uh, pension scheme. Now, when this issue came up in 2014, in fact, a white paper was written on it. And that white paper categorically rejected the attempt by the police and the National Assembly to pull out of it. What was the argument in that white paper? The argument in that white paper, as is the same argument now, is that, look, having all these independent pension board, uh, uh, pension board is unsustainable because where would the government get it, the money from? The same government that does not pay pension arrears. The same government that does not pay salaries as at when due. And it was thought that the pension administrators, the PFAs, as they are otherwise called, would be able to manage it better. Now, in the twilight of its existence, the Knight National Assembly has now gone further to follow up the National Assembly Pension Board, uh, uh, National Assembly Pension uh, Board Bill with the police pension board bill. In utter departure from the position of stakeholders, the Nigeria Labor Congress, the pension administrator's uh, body, who had said, no, this would not be sustainable. So the policemen who may be uh, happy uh, that, oh, OK, uh, we now have uh, this that has been approved. Well, what they should remember is that the the uh, bill, as proposed, puts the entire responsibility on the government. Under the uh, 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 old scheme, 
That's the situation. Under the contributory pension scheme, you know that at least part of your money has been taken and is being managed by pension fund administrators of your choice. They invest the money and you know you keep getting uh, some returns. But in any case, the Senate may have passed the bill. I don't know whether we have the concurrence of the House of Representatives, but the legislative process is that the president will, have, will still have to assent to it. So this bill having been passed, even with the concurrence, if it happens, of the House of Representatives, we still have to go to the desk of uh, President Tinubu. Will President Tinubu sign it into law? That is the, uh, that's the uh, end point of it. Or will he say, no, we're just studying it? After all, the Buhari administration you know, signed bills and didn't sign some. Even the sexual harassment bill, you know, which many Nigerians considered important, was not signed by uh, President Buhari uh, before he left. The last two bills that the uh, National Assembly hurriedly passed on ways and means and uh, you know, uh, uh, extension of the supplementary budget till December was not signed uh, by the president, but he still signed some uh, on the last day. Ahmed Lawan tells us that, in fact, uh, President Buhari signed uh, 112 bills, but he didn't consider some important. So there's a lot that the Tinubu administration needs to worry about. But what we are asking for is good intelligence, quality thoughts, proper consideration of all of this. Well, Tinubu supporters will say he has significant experience in this regard and that uh, he is capable of putting together the team of intelligent people who can weigh through uh, documents and offer him relevant uh, advice, in addition to his own street wisdom, you know, as I claimed. Uh, dear President Bola Tinubu, please do not sign this bill. And I'll tell you why. This is the reason why. We talk a lot about institutional memory. In the early days of popular mainstream comedy in Nigeria, things like Night of a Thousand Laughs, there used to be a popular running joke about railway pensioners, people that work for the Nigeria Railway Compression, on how they were poverty stricken. In fact, most top comedians today used to make jokes about Nigeria Railway Corporation workers. These were people that worked in the heyday of Nigeria Railway. But when it was time to pay them their money because of the defined benefit scheme, guess what happened? The government had no money to pay. And they were the butt of jokes. It was things like this that segued into in 2004 when President Olusegun Basanjo started this contribution pension scheme. Two things it did. Number one, it opened up an ecosystem. Prior to this time, prior to 2004, just imagine, there were no pension funds. There were no companies that ended up employing people and starting a new sector. But many years down the line, you have over 14 trillion held in pension funds that even some government officials were eyeing the money because how well they had used and utilized the money. That you had also a lot of people working in these pension companies. So with just one regulation, by President Olusegun Obasanjo, he opened up a 14 trillion naira industry. That's the power of thinking. Kudos to him. But guess what? Because these same people want to whittle down the power of that 14 trillion sector because of their own benefits, they now want to, rene they have reneged against it. They want to pull out of it so that they can give them a defined pension benefit scheme. And we all know what happens in government, misappropriation and corruption. I remind you of a name. Does the name Abdul Rashid Mayna ring a bell in your head? You remember Abdul Rashid Mayna? You remember what he did when he was saddled with the role of a tax force to be able to review pension? You remember the corruption scandal against him? That has constantly been the tale of our pension in this country. And we can't allow this happen. There are many benefits of the contribution pension scheme that is overseen by Pencom. Benefits like, do you know that if you put some money, part of your money aside, and your employer puts some money out for you, before you retire, you can take a certain portion of your money that you have stored and you can use it to buy real estate. Do you know that? About 25% of your RSA, retirement savings account. The joy that you can see your pension account in your hands like this. With defined benefit scheme, you can never get that. Your pension arrears is, is in the hands of government designing to pay. 
Our Nigerian government has got a governmental revenue problem. So on the year that government does not have revenue, they don't pay the money. And we all know how that used to be the case until President Muhammad Buhari came in and at least ensured that some of the pensions were paid off. We all remember how pensioners fought and fought and fought. And guess what? The money about the defined benefit scheme is that your money is not hinged against whims and carries of inflation. But here, your money is invested in very good, solid investment mechanisms that even when inflation comes, it doesn't whittle down your money. And you have more than enough of your money to be paid to you when the time comes. So it's about thinking. And those that have been hoodwinked in the police force to get out of this, they should remember what used to happen to railway workers back in the days and how people used to joke with them. And our people in the defined benefit scheme should remember the suffering pensioners now go through the defined benefit scheme where they have to go for verification and verification all over again. Don't you want the joy that when you're in your old age, you don't have to go for verification over and over and over again when you have your RSC account that you have contributed to and it's right there on your phone. So President Bolatinobu, please, you are a business person. Shore up the business sector. Let us do what is right and accountable. Let us not sign this draconian bill to take us back to those days that we don't want to go to. Isn't the suffering enough for the railway workers that served the country so hard and all they got in return was to become a butt of joke by comedians? Let us do what is right. And hey, the government has a revenue problem. Adding two trillion to the government bill is now problematic. Only if people don't take that money and corruptly steal it.